It's always a satisfying moment <clears throat> when the puzzle pieces come together. I know some of you like to do puzzles. I have a little patience for puzzles. <laughs> I just want to go do something else. <clears throat> but it's so wonderful to have the puzzle pieces of a situation, of your life, of your ambitions, of your family to come together. And you can see the pattern so wonderfully you develop in that moment when you had that aha. That's what that was about. And the painful things you might have gone through and the bewilderment and sometimes discouragement that you encountered come together in a moment, full cycle. And you say, yes, now I know. And the puzzle pieces come together. You know, our life is not just a disparate bunch of parts that are sequentially lived, but they are an integrated life of purpose. And God has a purpose in your life, in mine. And I hope that you and I have lots of those experiences where the pieces of the puzzle come together for you. And maybe not totally all at once, but you can begin to see God's hand at work in your life, in your family, in your church and understand what he's doing, going full circle. You see that not only in life every day, in your own life, where, and I hope you don't have to wait until you're 90 years old to have the, that full cycle come together moment. I think you can have lots of those and anticipate them. And knowing that God is at work, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are God's workmanship. The word in the Greek there is poema. Poema means work of art. God's not making a sloppy mess. I don't care how you feel when you get out of bed on uh, spring ahead Sunday. <laughs> but God makes works of art, and that's your life. I know you don't always feel that way. I don't. But given a whole, it's like the rainbow in the poem on the back of the bulletin today. It has gradients of beauty that come together to make one thing that is so majestic and good in your life. You and I are works of art in his hands. Don't take my word for it. That's what the Apostle Paul said. The Bible, and it says also in Ephesians chapter 2 that through us, the manifold wisdom of God is being broadcast. His manifold wisdom of God, that manifold means rainbow-like gradients, the color of your life. And so your life sometimes feels random, non-integrated, bits and pieces of this and that. But it's more than that. It's a work of art. And you see that in the Bible. We have this wonderful document called the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you can read parts of it and you say, huh, what was that about? And but then you get to know the word of God better and you see how it all comes together. It makes full circle. The pieces of the puzzle begin to fall into place because this is an integrated whole. And it has parts of it that are dark, parts of it that are shining and bright, parts of it that are gray, Parts of it are brilliant, 
just like a tapestry or just like a mosaic. Recently, I was watching these archaeologists. They had dis discovered this ancient Roman um, mosaic covered by maybe a thousand or more years of, of uh, soot and dust, but they could see it. And they got it cleared off, but you still couldn't see it. And then suddenly, five or six of the helpers of the archaeologists took five-gallon buckets and threw on top of it, and that mud washed away and outshone, outshone that beautiful mosaic, as beautiful as the day it was made. The expressions on the faces of the maidens in those mosaics and the people and the flowers, it was so wonderful. But each of those pieces, here's a mosaic. And it comes together to make one whole. Sometimes we don't see it. You gotta plow through. For instance, salvation was lost in a garden. It was struggled for and gained back in a garden. The Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane, and will be fully realized in another garden. Paradise in glory. Three gardens. It comes together. Only God could have made that happen that way. One man lost salvation, Adam, but you know, there's a second Adam. There's a second Adam. His name is Jesus. One man lost salvation, another man purchased salvation for all of us. And bought it back. There are at least seven or eight altars in the Bible. Altars of sacrifice, altars of praise, altars of incense. The Bible says that the whole earth is like an altar of incense before God. Especially when God's people come to church, it's like an altar of incense. All through the Bible, altars here and there and other ways. But there was one great altar where the blood was spilt, and that's called Calvary. That's called the cross, the cross of Jesus. Your personal journey through promise, through patience, and through patterns is a beautiful work of art from God. Doesn't feel like it sometimes, but it is. Let me read to you this passage. I, I read it to you last week. I quoted it to you last week, but I want to show it to you today. Paul, writing to the Romans, says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement that they provide, we might have hope. It all comes together, the bits and pieces, the dark and the light, the painful and the pleasant that we find in the scripture was written to teach us. It's a tapestry of revelation from God. And when we go there, we find encouragement, we find hope. And then he says, may the God who gives encouragement, endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other. That Christ, that Christ had. And the next word says that we, be, we may with one heart and one mind glorify God. And so when you think of your life as a tapestry, as a mosaic of bits and pieces, of threads, dark and light, black and gold, when you see what Paul says here, we need to look at each other that way. When I look in the mirror, I say, oh, what a wonderful work of art. <laughs> you believe that? I don't say that. <laughs> but if, if we really meant that, we really believed that, that you could look into the mirror and see a work of art, but I need to see it in your eyes too. And see it in your life as well. 
And I don't know the days and times of your life, but I know that God is at work in your life in the mosaic and the tapestry, and you are being developed into a wonderful work of art that will shine throughout eternity. The rainbow colors of God's wisdom are coming through you. You and I are works of art. Jesus paid on the great altar of sacrifice to make it happen. We need to let it happen and know that God is at work in your life. We need to anticipate those aha moments. I am one who believes in progressive revelation. That throughout the scripture, starting at Genesis chapter 1 and going through Revelation chapter 22, it's a progression. And more and more light and more and more revelation about God assumed page by page, chapter by chapter in the word of God. It's a whole. And it's meant to change my life and yours. <clears throat> and so your life and your history and my life and my history, the mosaic, the tapestry that God is developing in us is a beautiful thing. The vast revelation of God in scripture is a montage of uncommon beauty. It's not unconnected. There's no part in the scripture that's unconnected from the rest. And we began to see that more and more as we understand God's word more and more because it is so precious, so, so wonderful. I love the word of God. When I became a Christian at 16, I began my lifelong love affair with the Bible. When my mom got me a little Woolworth's five and 10 cent store Bible that she had kept and with a zipper around it. You know, you used to come to church, people had zipper Bibles and the pastor would say, let us turn, you hear all these zippers coming out. People open up their Bibles. But I began to love the word went to Washington Bible College <clears throat> and was so enamored and so drawn to the texture and tapestry of God's word. Where I went to Bible College was more like a brethren type dispensational school. I've kind of gotten away from some of that. But the love that they had in President Miles of Washington Bible College he got so he couldn't see, and he had this great big magnifying glass. And you could see him hold that magnifying glass, reading the Bible as best he could from it, because he loved the Word. He knew that it was a tapestry, and how God was blessing him. And so, if you want to see the tapestry of someone's life, and the montage, and the mosaic, Look at Abraham and Sarah. It's like you can't separate the two of them. We always talk about Abraham, Abraham, but remember just Abraham and Sarah. Abram and Sarai, as she was called then. God changed their names. Abraham, touched by God. Sarah, they got their name changed on the same day because of God's wonderful work in their lives. They were plucked out of the moon-worshipping Ur of the Chaldees by the sheer grace of God. God spoke to Abraham. Abraham listened, and he began to see that God had something much more for him. It's so glorious, and if you can just read, it's a short read. And some of Abraham's right to say, why did he do that? And I wonder sometimes too, but <clears throat> from Genesis chapter 11, 10 or 11, up to chapter 22, you see this wonderful developing story of someone's life that was plucked from darkness and set in the promised land. So blessed. Why did God bless Abraham? I'll tell you. I don't know. 
And nobody else does either. Because he was an idol worshiper, as his father, Carol, was. But God stepped in and changed him. Changed both of them in wonderful, sometimes strange ways. He called Abraham, at that time Abram, and brought him into the promised land. And he never quite felt at home anymore. When God took him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, away from the moon-worshipping idol temples, and they had some despicable practices, he, he came away from that, he and Sarah, and they began that wonderful journey with God, but they never felt quite at home anymore. You've heard the song, the country song, this world's not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. Abraham and Sarah started the journey, left the darkness of the Ur of the Chaldees, pointed their face to the rising sun of the east, and began their journey with God. It was not complete until the day that Abraham put his feet up in the bed for the last time, and when Sarah was painfully and tearfully laid to rest by her husband Abraham. And so it is with us. I hope you read that montage of a story. A couple of things stick out to me. Abraham rescued his POW nephew, Lot, from five kings. And in doing so, in a very strategic way, which is 338 men, made some powerful enemies. But he made a couple of good friends. And in chapter 15, I know that Abraham is thinking about the retaliation that may be coming his way because of his great victory and rescuing his POW son, uh, uh, nephew, Lot. And God was touching him. But then one day, in one day, Abraham met the king of Sodom, as we've talked about it before, and the Bible says, before God rained fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah, they were already wicked people. Did you know there's at least five or six places in the United States that's called, that have the city name of Sodom? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a Sodom, Kentucky. I don't know if I want to live there. <laughs> there's several. And they were usually named by someone who said, boy, there's a bunch of rowdy people. And there's a, in Europe, there's a couple. Sodom. But Abraham met the king of Sodom. And he was one of the defeated kings. And Abraham had his stuff, had some of his people that he had rescued along with Lot. And Abraham had the spoils of some of Sodom. Abraham gave it back. He would not take a shekel. Thank you. 
that teaches you to switch to now. 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 Switch to
It took two. And if you read this, <clears throat> Abraham brought these things, laid them apart, birds of prey, came down it, uh, Abraham drove them away. This is kind of a strange deal, but not really. <clears throat> As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. He's waiting for the Lord to cut covenant with him. And a thick, dreadful darkness came over him. And the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated there, but I will punish the nation they served as slaves. And afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace, Abraham. So the covenant still has not been cut. The sacrifice is still laying there. And by the way, this is all, not all that strange. If you think about it, we use the term cutting covenant or cutting a deal. This is the same That's where this came from. Do you know that when, <clears throat> uh, when they took a bottle of champagne and break it across the bow of a new ship, that has its origins in blood covenant. They used to use red wine. Before that, they used the blood of a goat or something to mark the, the, and ask the gods to bless that new boat. It was all blood, blood covenant. And then they used red wine to make the red stain. And then they used bubbly because that showed sacrifice, I guess, more visible. And you know, there's something instinctive in children about this. Do you know that? Have you ever used the term with your buddy or your, your girlfriend? That's my blood brother. That's my blood sister. And many times the kids will prick their fingers and put their fingers together. You know that? Have you seen that? Maybe you've done it. I don't know. And you became blood brothers or blood sisters. It's in the DNA. It's somewhere inside that the covenant has to be cut, blood has to be shed. Jesus ultimately played, uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice with his own blood. And you know, you and I are blood brothers with Jesus. And say hallelujah to that. And you will be buried there with good age. And when the sun had set and darkness had fallen. Now this is where it really gets weird. This gets strange. You follow me? This, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared out of the darkness and passed between the pieces. God cut the covenant. But he didn't wait for Abraham. He did it all by himself. You say, why did God reveal himself as a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch? I'll tell you why. Nobody knows. <laughs> but this is God revealing himself, going right through the middle of the sacrifice, as two individuals would. But he's saying, wait a minute, Abraham, I'm doing this all by myself. This is just something I'm doing. It's called a unilateral covenant. I'm not depending on you to do anything. I'm doing this myself, Abraham. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. To your descendants, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. God made that covenant. In the darkness, it seems so strange and dark. Abraham beating the vultures away, sun setting, darkness coming over him. He's feeling the, the prophecy of, of uh, Israel going to, into Egypt. God says, don't worry, you're going to get the whole land of Egypt. And so you and I see this. It's a part of the puzzle where God did not wait for Abraham. Abraham's asleep. And this pot of burning smoke, smoke many times is referencing the, the holiness of God. It was a pillar of smoke that led Israel. 
and the burning torch is always the symbol of the purifying, enlightening presence of God as well. It's going through the, the sacrifice in a unilateral covenant, covenant between God and Abraham. You know, the, the covenant that you and I have with God is unilateral. He didn't wait for you to do anything. Oh, I need to be good and sin less and do the best I can, but that didn't bring me salvation. It's when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he alone passed through the pieces. He alone cut covenant. He alone shed his blood so that you and I could be in covenant relationship with him. And feel free to walk into the very presence of God. And we see vestiges of blood sacrifice around us today. God did show up. God did cut covenant with Abraham. And God wants to be in covenant with you. But he is making the covenant himself. Just as God picked up Abraham out of the land of darkness of Ur, in the darkness of the west and pointed his face east into the land of light, God called you the same way. You are his. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you are bought with a price. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. You are his. some of the strange sound effects. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That was right on cue. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a strange vision. But it was something that Abraham it went through. And we are there to see it as part of the puzzle of his life that it comes together. Now, I read this to you last week. Paul was writing to the Galatians, understand then, these guys who were trying to earn their own salvation through keeping the law, understand then that those who have the faith, have faith are children of Abraham. He, Jesus, redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through, through Jesus Christ, so that the faith, so that by faith we may receive the promise of the Spirit. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed Amen. according to the promise. Whatever God uh, promised Abraham is sitting in your lap today. I'm going to show you in a minute. The New Living Translation. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true seed, true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise of Abraham belongs to you. Now, I didn't say that. I didn't make that up. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Just as Abraham went under the stars, and God said, I'm going to bless you as many of the stars and as much as the sand of the seaside. God, that's a promise for you as well. And when we come to the end of days, we'll know, we'll see the great magnificent tapestry and mosaic that God put together in your life and my life as well. So just a few things I wanted to share with you, but I'm just so excited about this word because I want you and I to know that God has cut covenant with us. The blood sacrifice has been made and we have been purchased and bought with a price because of what Jesus has done. Grasp the truth of progressive re revelation. You read this strange page in the Old Testament, you say, huh, what is that about? What, what's that about? But now we see the whole thing put together from Genesis to the rest of the Old Testament to the blood sacrifice of Jesus. And there's one more place I want to take you. But we need, there's a progression that takes place that God reveals to us. You know, our little box of brains can't take it all in at one time. Don't even try. Page by page, precept by precept, principle by principle, 
God teaches us his word and he puts the tapestry of our lives together. Know that there is a completed covenant. You cannot add to the covenant of God. You can only benefit from the covenant of God. And Paul says, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body and your mind and your soul. Glorify him. That's the only thing we can do. We just stand in awe in God's presence and at the cross of Jesus, that blood sacrifice, and just say, thank you. I want to glorify you. There is a completed covenant that's been cut. Understand that your inheritance through Abraham and through Christ it's yours. It's mine. And that's part of the whole progressive revelation from the Old Testament to today for you and I. Understand and, con- and I, I always quote it this way, understand, connect the dots Christianity. It's not just a bunch of random verses of the Bible. It's the truth of God revealed. We need to connect the dots in our lives and know that he is at work in our lives in magnificent ways. Connect the dots. Take the thrill of your covenant endowments. We should be thrilled at what God has done for us and take it and rejoice. After this I looked, and before me was a great multitude that no one could count of every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's the promise of Abraham being fulfilled right there in the book of Revelation. God says, I'm going to bless the entire world through you, Abraham. And there'll be so many that nobody, nobody could count them. And here it is, the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham right here before us. They were wearing white robes and were holding palms in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. It doesn't belong to me. I didn't do anything about it. Salvation belongs to God. Quit trying to earn it. (laughs) And he he who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. But now that's a vision. Now we can just listen to it. And this is even more profound, I think. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude this is the promise of Abraham being fulfilled I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and like the peals of thunder shouting hallelujah for the Lord our God almighty reigns let us rejoice and be glad rejoice and be glad because the promise of Abraham is right here fulfilled from every nation tribe people and tongue as God said in Genesis chapter 15 is fulfilled I'm going to be there aren't you pray with me Father we thank you that we can connect the dots and we can see the pieces of the puzzle coming together and how you are so magnificently working with your works of art in whatever history whatever pieces we can play as Pinole Valley Community Church in the great great mosaic of salvation the great tapestry help us Lord to fulfill that task and do it well help us Lord we pray to feed the hungry and clothe the children in Africa buy medicine in Kenya Offer salvation to Penol and be the people of God. Help us, Lord, to know that the promise of Abraham is ours. Help us, Lord, we pray, to go through these days of strife and anger and pain, knowing that the day of redemption is soon to come and the promise of Abraham will be totally, completely fulfilled. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Can you say amen?
Yes.